Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be reading from there in a moment. First Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 12. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to to, to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Let us pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us about who we are. Thank you for this particular passage that stresses our role as members of the body of Christ. I pray, Father, that you would speak into our lives, that your Holy Spirit would touch our minds to retain what we hear and what you have to say to us, that our hearts would be receptive to what you're trying to speak into our lives, that we may grow in our faith, that we may become more like you, that we may follow you closely. Help us to be the church that you want us to be. And Lord, we'll praise you for what you do and what you accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Why bother with the church? Why bother? You say, well, that's a strange question for a preacher to ask on Sunday morning, don't you think? You'd think that uh, at least a preacher would be a little bit more... Uh, knowledgeable about that. But it's not the first time a question like that's been raised. There are people who do wonder, why do we bother with the church? There may be someone who heard, someone's here today that you're here, but do I really need to be? Is it really that important? And is the church that important? Well, I've been doing this for quite a while 
And I do believe the question has some validity. Not that we should give up on the church, but that we might take a hard look at why we bother with the church. I believe if we don't take a critical look at what the church is all about, we're going to be less and less effective at doing the work that God has called us to do. I don't believe at all that the church is dead, that the church is a thing of the past. There seems to be a decline in attendance across the board in churches, but I don't believe that God is through with the church at all. For the next several weeks, we want to look at the church. Not the building, not a denomination, but the people that we are. As we read earlier, you are the church, I am the church. We make up the church, the body of Christ. Today I want to address the nature of the church. And I've put as a title to the message, as you can see on the green sheet if you're using that, called, separated, and united. These words describe who the church is who you are, who I am. As we look into this, I want us to consider today just what the nature of our very being is as a church. As we continue the next couple of Sundays, we want to look further into how we contribute to this. Because we have to contribute in order to make the church effective. It's not just a passive thing. If, if we, the people, don't contribute to what the church is doing, then the church is ineffective. And I know there's a lot of tired people. Many of you have worked in the church all your lives. You say, it's time for somebody else to take over. And that's many times true. We do need the younger generation to come up and to replace those who are becoming aged, but there's always a place for you. There's always going to be a place for me in the body of Christ to make the church his church. Not the local church necessarily, but his church effective. Let's begin by talking about the nature of the church being a company of believers. And this, as I read in, in 1 Corinthians 12, describes a universal church. We might, what I may, mean by universal church, I want to clarify that because some people might get the impression that the universal church is, um, is a denomination or it's something that uh, is a, a group of people that we can identify. And uh, there are some churches who, uh, in their own theology, say they are the universal church. But I know that that's not right because everybody who professes the name of Christ is part of the universal church. So the, the church is both universal and local. When we talk about the local church, we're talking about you right here at Genesis. We're talking about people who are gathered in local settings. And, and we'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks to come. But we're talking about being a part of this body, universal and local. And the universal church is comprised of believers of all time. All believers of all time. The church is a spiritual body united by a common faith in Jesus Christ. Now this may sound academic to you, but I don't want you to get hung up on the academic aspect of this. Consider the fact that the church that we're talking about in the universal church is a spiritual body. It's not Methodists or Baptists or Presbyterians or Pentecostals. It's not people in Newcastle or Mercer or, or uh, Columbus or uh, 
some foreign country. The, the church is a spiritual body, and we're united by a common faith in Jesus Christ. What is most important here is that we understand that we are united not by worship styles and not by quirky doctrines and not by uh, locations or language or whatever the case may be. We are connected because we believe that Jesus Christ is the virgin-born Son of God, Savior of the world, and the soon-coming King. That's what unites us together. And because that unites us together, we can worship with people that don't attend our church. We can worship with people who don't have the same name over their doorpost. Because if we believe that, if we believe that that's who Jesus is, if that's our uni unifying factor, then we are part of the body of Christ. It is, the church is a living organism. And we're going to talk about two things. One is organism, and one is organization. We all know organization very well. I don't want to emphasize that right now. But organism is something that's important. And as a living organi organism, we are not restricted by time or space. We're not restricted by this century or this decade or our lifetime. We are not restricted by being here in this location or in Newcastle or anywhere else. The church as a living organism is the total of all people who have ever professed a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so, do you know that you and I and the Apostle Paul all belong to the same church. Hey, great. Now, you, you, you would probably be, you'd probably be very proud if some famous person came to our church and joined our church. I mean, wouldn't it be something if a professional sports person attended our church? And not for their offering, but just because they come to our church. Or wouldn't it be great if a uh, big name person would, you know, we'd say, boy, so and so comes to my church. Probably, you'd probably say it for the wrong reasons, but, you know, just saying. But do you know that the Apostle Paul, do you know that the great Revivalist of the 15th and 16th and 17th, 18th centuries, all belong to the same church you and I belong to? We are the body of Christ. All believers from the 1st century to the 21st century are equally members of the universal church, whether they're located in the Middle East or in the Americas, we belong to the same church. Now, this church is a spiritual body, I, as I've mentioned already, but the second thing I want to point out about this is that the church is called out from the world and separated from sin. Now, we're going to a different level here because you may be gone, begin to think, well, now he's going to start meddling in my affairs. But don't look at it that way. Look, consider it this way. The, the church, the word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. And I don't throw around Greek too often, but ekklesia is a term that refers to the church. And it, 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 it's defined as an assembly or the called out ones, meaning we've been called out from the world in which we live. Now, from that word, we get the adjective ecclesiastical. And that is a... Uh, f uh, word that describes things that pertain to the church or pertain to clergy. It's a, it's a word that, uh, you know, 
comes out of that word ecclesia. But what it's basically saying to us is that the church is called to be different from the world. And I think this is something we need to come to grips with. It's something we need to be reminded of. And this is kind of gets into another level of this message this morning. The biblical writers addressed believers as being called or invited into this fellowship. Romans chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 says, And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, we read, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. In the book of Jude, the first verse, It says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are the loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Now I want you to just let this sink in for a moment this morning. You, if you are a professing believer in Jesus Christ, if you have trusted him as your Savior, and if you are considering yourselves to be a Christian. I don't don't care what terminology you want to put on that, but if that's where you consider yourself to be this morning, you have been called out from the world. You have been invited to be a part of something that is a microcosm of the the world that's out there. we're, We're called to be something here, which we call the organism of the church. The church is called to live differently from the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I grew up in a culture, a church culture, that believed that the church, Christians, believers, whatever, were to be separate from the world. And that meant you never did what the world did. You dressed differently, you didn't wear certain things, and, you know, I, 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 they, they always pick on the women more than the men, you know. I was going to say no makeup, no jewelry, no earrings, but you'd think maybe I was kind of weird myself wearing those things, and I'm not talking about myself. But, but those are the things I grew up with, and, and, and you could really tell a Christian. All you had to do is look at them. They, 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 they wore their dresses down to their ankles, their sleeves down to their, their wrists, and no earrings, no makeup, and their hair tied up in a bun, and, uh, and then they walked around real happy looking. And, and you can just tell that, you know, that was what the Christian, Christians were. That's not being separate. It, 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 it's separating yourself in one way, I'm sure. But believers are not to withdraw from the world, nor are we to be quarantined from, belie- from unbelievers. How, how are we going to reach the world if we quarantine ourselves from them and don't go near them? If we treat the world and sinners as being poison and we can't go that route then how can we reach them we are to separate ourselves what we are to separate ourselves from is sinful activity in whatever form that takes the problem I see today and the concern I have for the church of this century and where we live right now is that the contemporary church is not much different from the society in which we live and this is really sad. If we stop and pause and kind of let that sink in this morning, 
there's not much different between the behavior of people who attend church and the people who do, don't attend church. And this, this has become much a part of our society today. Many people will say, well, you know, that's just a sign of the times. Well, I'm sure it is, but you all, if you're old enough to remember, and, and, and I, I'm putting myself in that category because I do remember some things, back in the uh, middle of the last century, that church Christians just didn't do things that they're doing today. And then we've excused it. We just said, well, we, you know, we, we live this way. And, and uh, so many things about the way uh, people treated marriage and, and living together and those kind of things and, and uh, activities and, and night, nightlife and all those kind of things. And you say, well, <laughs> be careful, preacher, because I don't want... I don't want to be, you know, you're stepping on my toes here. And I, I'm not about that. I'm not about pointing a finger at you, because if I do, i got three pointing back at me, and I don't like that either. But I do know that we all live in a time when we need to be very careful that there's a difference between us and the world. The world should be able to look at Christians and say, you know, there's something different about them that I like, and I want to be like them. I want to have what they have. They have something I don't have. Instead of being just like everybody else, the only difference is we might get up on Sunday morning, we might go to church, we might spend an hour and a half there or give or take a few minutes, and then we go back to our separate lives and, and, and doing things just like the world. That's the nature of the church that we should be. We should be people as a spiritual body. But we also, the nature of the church is a company of believers that are diverse and yet unified. And so I want to address today the, the role that we play in the body of Christ. Paul compares the body of Christ to the human body. He uses a human body, which we're very familiar with. You know, we're very familiar with the human body, aren't we? You know when something hurts, you know what part of the body hurts. And it may not be a part you can see. It may not be a part of the body that it gets much attention, but it, it's, a, it, it's something that uh, is going on in your life, and you know what's going, going on there. There are many parts that form one overall body. And Paul says in verse 14 that we were all given the one spirit to drink. And what he's talking about here is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that indwells all believers has been given to all of us as, as believers. And see, again, I want to emphasize the fact that if, if you profess Christ, if you are following Jesus, if you, if you have made that commitment the Holy Spirit came into your life. He, he indwells you at that point. There's not something else you have to do to get the Holy Spirit. Now, there's other things that happen in our lives that may be manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but you have the Holy Spirit, and He has as much of you right now that you'll give Him. He indwells us. He is in us. That's why I've often said, when you came to church today, the Spirit was here because you brought Him with you. You can, you, you can never accurately say, well, I went to church and, and the Spirit wasn't there. Well, if He wasn't there, it's probably your fault because if He wasn't in you, then maybe He didn't come with you. But the truth of the matter is, many are gathered here this morning and the Holy Spirit indwells every believer, therefore He is here may not manifest himself the same way every time, may not be some things that you expected to happen or wished would have happened It didn't happen. We can get argue that all day long. But you can argue the, cannot argue the fact that, that the Holy Spirit is here because he came with us. He indwells all believers. And God has placed all of the parts just as he wanted them to be. And this, this is... Re, this is something that's really enlightening. 
we started our Sunday school class this morning by saying, who am I and why am I here? What, what is my identity? What, 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 what is about me? And, 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 and the, the answer to that is, we are created beings of God. He is, God created us in his image and his likeness, and he has brought us into being for a purpose. I want to say this to you this morning. I want everybody to hear this. Open your ears extra right now, okay? In fact, take, everybody take a real deep breath right now. Just inhale. Big. Bigger. And exhale. Okay? Now, see, you got a little bit, you're a little bit more awake, because I know some of you are kind of, you know, the heat does that to you, plus creatures can do that to you as well. But I want you to hear this this morning. You are perfectly you. Okay? You are you. There is no other you. There's no one else like you, and there is no other you that you ought to try to be like. Oh, I wish I was like so-and-so. Why? Because God made you to be you. God's purpose for you is uniquely yours. And I'll tell you, God does have a purpose for you. God has something for you to do. You say, well, I don't know what that is. Well, that's the... That's the challenge that we have in following Christ because we need to find that out. And we find that out by in, in, immersing ourselves with the Word and in the context of his, his Holy Spirit in our lives, and He will reveal that to us. But the body is made up of many parts, and if every part were the same, there would be no body. Now, just, just, just bear with me here this morning. This isn't, this isn't very intellectual, and this isn't something that you know makes me sound very scholarly. But the body is made up of many parts into one body, and if it wa if it were not one body in many parts, they would just be like a warehouse with a box of noses and a box of ears and a box of eyes and some hands over here and some feet over there and you wouldn't look at those boxes and say oh look at the body you would say hmm look at those body parts you know oh there's some eyes I wish I had blue ones but those are all brown you know, it's, 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 it's not that stupid isn't it but that's what I'm talking about the body of Christ we're not all the same if we all the same we would be a bunch of noses. Yeah, that's why we're so nosy sometimes. Oh, okay. The body is God's way of saying, you are perfectly you. And God put the body together so that there should be no division. One part, Paul says, here in 1 Corinthians 12, cannot say to another part, I don't need you. Yet that's what often happens in the church. It's so sad when we are willing to look at somebody else who's not just like us, who doesn't maybe even think the same way we do, maybe doesn't have the same abilities we do, and we look at them and say, I don't need you. You're not important. We would never do that to ourselves. We would never say to our hand or our foot, I don't need you. Cut you off. We would never say, I got two eyes, so I'll just pluck one of them out. I don't need that one. It's ridiculous. But we have done that in the church. We have looked at people in the church and we've said, you're not, you're not, you don't measure up to me. You, you're different than me. And I don't need you. I'm glad today that God includes me in this universal body of believers in spite of all of my shortcomings and all of my failures and all of my 
times that I don't do what God wants me to do. He still includes me. I've been thinking a lot about eternity lately. I think, I've been thinking about looking back when I'm in heaven. Of course, I won't probably have time to do this in heaven, but just thinking about what would it have been like if I'd done things differently? Mm -hmm. You ever do that? You know, the problem is God has chosen us and uniquely gifted us to do what he wants us to do. And if we obey, obey him, we don't have to be like anybody else. We don't have to be like someone. We should have equal concern for each other. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 12. And, and as, a, as a basis for next Sunday and the Sunday that follows, I, I just want to just understand that we are part of a spiritual body, that we are diverse, yet we're unified because there could be no division. We should have that equal concern for each other. It, 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 Paul says if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And we may not be able to relieve that suffering. Now keep this in mind. Just because someone is suffering, we can, we can drive ourselves nuts trying to relieve suffering we cannot relieve. God has to be at work. But that doesn't change the fact that if you're suffering, I ought to feel that with you. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. When a part of the church is suffering, we all should feel, feel their suffering, and if a part is being blessed, then their blessing, we should rejoice in their blessing rather than being envious or critical. It could be someone we know or someone we don't know. You may know a grieving friend right now. You may know somebody right now who is grieving a loss of a loved one. And it's hard. It's difficult. But it, there are persecuted Christians around the world that are grieving as well that you'll never meet. But they're grieving in a different way. You may know somebody just had a financial windfall. That's when it's tough not to get jealous, isn't it? Someone comes into a lot of money and you say, oh, well, I wish I did. Do we, rejoice, do we rejoice with them or not? But you know, some churches, this has happened a lot over the last couple of decades, have been experiencing growth when many other churches are not. I read about churches, know of churches that, well, they started out with 100 people, and next thing you know, they got 10,000. Hmm, what, what are they doing that's different? Well, what usually happens is we go, well, they must not be very spiritual. They must be compromising. They must, they must be doing things that, you know, don't go there, because you don't know that for sure, and it's just a sign of jealousy when it comes to be a part of our style. We are the body of Christ. And each one of us is a part of that body. As the church grasps our place in God's world and understands our purpose, we are then most effective. The very nature of the church is that we are called out of the world, separated from sin, and even though we're diverse, we are united together by our common faith in Jesus Christ. What holds us together today is not our doctrine. It's not our, it's not our uniqueness in our church. It's not, it's not our worship style or it's not our air-conditioned building, <laughs> wishful thinking. It, it's not our location or our heritage. What holds us together today 
is that we believe in Jesus Christ. And that He came to this earth. He lived among us. He suffered and died. And He rose again. And He's coming back. That is what holds us together. That is what makes us His church. So why bother with the church? Why bother with church? Because I believe it's God's chosen way to reach people with the good news of the gospel. He chose this church among the hundreds in Lawrence County around the world to be the church that he wants us to be to be the influence in this community, to be his hands and feet in the world today. He chose us for that. He may cho choose another church somewhere else for a different reason, but he chose us. We are God's best choice to reach the world for him the church of Jesus Christ. And we are a part of that. That's who we are. That's why we should bother with church. Because it's that important. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word. And we thank you today that we are the body of Christ. We belong to a family. A family that's right here in this room. But the family that we'll see from other churches in the restaurants this afternoon. The family that we'll work with side by side tomorrow. The family that we'll go to school with. We belong to a family that lived centuries ago. We're all part of that family. And so I thank you for the nature of the church. Help us to grow in that understanding so that we may be the effective church you want us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.